Hello everybody, welcome to Modern Database Concepts. I'm Johannes Schilken. I'm a professor for databases at the OTH Regensburg. And uh, yeah, we will have a master course this semester about modern database concepts. So before we begin, um, I'm happy that you all joined via this um, YouTube live session here. And first of all, before we start with the first chapter today, big data management, um, I want to get some details of who you are. So um, I, I made this video, this live stream publicly available on YouTube. So maybe <laughs> there's somebody who is not attending that lecture. That's, that, that's what I want. So <laughs> it's not for only the students who want to attend that lecture and attend the exercises and uh, uh, afterwards do the exam. Um, I want to make this publicly available because every week we have one topic of one concept in modern databases. Um, and today the topic is big data management. So. Uh, can you please write in the chat something uh, who you are? Uh, we have uh, people from, from from other countries here, so uh, from different uh, countries, and uh, it would be interesting for me to get to know uh, something about you. So you can use the chat and I uh, recommend to you to use the chat of the YouTube live uh, very often. Ah, yeah. Here's somebody from Hong Kong, that's very nice. Of course people from Regensburg, from the Ostbayerische Technische Hochschule, University of Technology of Applied Sciences in Regensburg, that I guess are most of them, probably based in Regensburg. The sound is a bit echo. Maybe I can um, tweak the sound a bit. Let me um, try it out. So, is the sound better now? How is the audio quality now? No, it's not better. Um, what can I do then? What can I do? Um, so Let's switch to this one. It's not this microphone. Now it's better, much better. Okay, let me see what else uh, you're writing in the in the chat right now. Um, except from the sound thing, most people are from um, from the University of Regensburg, uh, exchange student from Moscow. Nice. Um, <laughs> Bavarian forest. Yeah, nice. If you want to uh, continue introducing yourself, just write in the chat. Write in the chat and I continue now uh, by uh, giving you some um, introductory slides. Um, first of all, the lectures starting today. Um, you find these slides here in the CRIPS system. So the CRIPS system, uh, there you found the link. Uh, <laughs> and there you find also pdf slides and um, my slides that i use for my presentations here in the video um, are very compact they don't have a lot of text usually but i are uh, I, I i i i talk a lot so i try to write the most important things in a little box 
that it's printed in on the on the bottom of the slides when you download the PDF. So when you download the PDF, the slides are annotated with some notes. So uh, to give you more information than just written on the slides. So today and every uh, no, this must be a Tuesday. So not Thursday, uh, but Tuesday. Um, 1.45, but uh, you were all correct. Um, this must be, of course, Tuesday. Oops, I want to fix this very soon. Then we have it correct here. So Tuesday, uh, 1.45 p.m. is our lecture and it's always like this. So I will post link after link um, on the on the web page you can join like you do now um, live so we have currently 86 uh, people watching me live that's very nice um, if you don't have time or you come late or so on so you can also uh, join 10 minutes later and then watch it in an increased speed or something 1.5 or 1.25 uh, uh, the, the speed and then you are live again or you can watch it um, yeah, time shifted uh, or you can watch it this evening or this weekend so simply use the same link and you come to the video either it's live or it's uh, not live anymore um, but I recommend to you to be live there because then we have the chat so um, then um, yeah, then you can uh, ask questions like this. And I think the question is already answered. The stream is only live or recorded and available afterwards too. It's available afterwards too. So yes, simply click on that link this evening and you will see the, uh, the same video again. So you can um, use this as a recording too. So you don't have to be synchronous here. It's also possible to watch it asynchronous. But I recommend to be live. Then you can ask questions in the chat and we will do uh, interactions and quizzes and little exercises uh, during the lecture. So I will ask a question and then you take your mobile phone, go to a website that I show you very soon and then you can click on an option and then I have a chart here. So that's what we do very often in this lecture. Yeah. <laughs> that's, uh, yeah, yeah, that's because I, I copy pasted the slides from a German lecture. Uh, yeah, this Uhr means o'clock. <laughs> yeah, I, I do this so that the people from uh, Hong Kong and so on learn a bit German too. Um, the exercises, um, I just want to show you that we have exercises. We have 12 exercise sheets. So when we talk about a specific concept in one lecture, there will be an exercise sheet about that. In total, 12 exercise sheets and you can solve the exercises on that sheet. You download them on the CRIPS website. But uh, yeah, I wrote here 26th of um, March, there will be the first exercise. Um, so this is, a, this is a Friday. So this Friday, this Friday there will not be an exercise session. So if you have it in your calendar already, uh, this Friday there is nothing. But Friday in a week, there will be the first exercise session. And the exercises are via Zoom. So <laughs> the lecture is via YouTube Live and the exercises are via Zoom. And you um, participate in a, um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a in a group of two students and me. So we will be th three people in that Zoom slot. So and you have to choose a slot. So by the end of this week, I will um, post uh, in the CRIPS system a little uh, survey, a poll, 
that you can choose a slot, for example, Friday um, 11.45 or Friday 11.50. So there will be five minute slot. And during these uh, five uh, here on this slide, I, I wrote seven minute slots, but now I saw how many people there are. Um, but um, when we have um, 100 people, uh, this uh, this is not feasible anymore. Maybe I I, I I reduce them to five minutes. Maybe I say uh, not two uh, people in one slot, but three or so. Um, you will see by the end of this week how we do that. So you show me your solution of your exercise. You can ask questions and I will ask you questions and I will give you feedback on your solutions. That's how the exercises work. I upload a document, an exercise sheet as a PDF with some exercises. Then you install a system or write queries or yeah, do some other exercises. And um, then in this slot that you reserved, we discuss about your solution. You can share your screen and show me your solution then. How are we exercising within a five minute slot? This is a very good question. You don't solve the exercise within this five minute slot. You solve the exercise beforehand. So if you solve it at home, okay, you're at home all the time currently, but um, yeah, so you solve the exercise beforehand. And if you have questions and problems, you can ask in the forum of this uh, course, or you can send me an email but use the forum is better. Um, and then you show me your solution within five minutes. It's just the discussion of the solution, exactly. Okay, I cannot say a lot about the exam. So, um, Later this semester, so in one or two months, I will give you uh, details about the exam. Whether it will be a written exam, I guess it will be a written exam, or maybe it will be an oral exam via Zoom. I don't know yet, and um, we will make this very flexible. So you learn all the concepts and do the exercises and uh, independently how we do the exam later, um, you will pass this course when you know all the concepts and um, uh, answer questions, whether they are written or oral. So it's not determined yet whether it will be an oral or written exam. So I cannot tell you something more like this little slide here. So what will be the contents of this lecture? Um, the lecture is called Modern Database Concepts and this is a very, um, very generic term and this is very nice for me as a, a database uh, professor because um, then I can present what I like. So the problem is what means modern? Modern means up to date, so not an old fashioned stuff. When I would tell you um, SQL fundamentals here, how to uh, bring a table in a third normal form or uh, how to write a group by query in SQL. This is not modern database concept. This is from the 1970s. Um, but the same you can tell for some of these uh, topics here. Modern database concepts, CSV file, XML, this format is dead and so on. This does not mean that these are all modern database concept. They belong to a big thing. So for example, when you understand XML, you understand semi-structured data and there are uh, modern formats for semi-structured data. We look at JSON uh, next week. JSON is used in the MongoDB database for storing JSON documents. We take a look on how to query them, how to, um, um, how to store them and search them efficiently. And um, when you know the historical concepts, 
XML was very prominent 20 years ago and it is still used so nothing dies immediately so XML is something you should know uh, even if it's not uh, the up-to-date standard today and um, when you understand XML you understand uh, JSON better for example XML has a query language called jQuery and this jQuery uses flower expressions and we take a look at a JSON query language uh, JSONic this also uses uh, flower expressions so you understand the whole thing better in the end yeah today we will look at big data platforms what is big data how to analyze it and uh, what are the challenges and the trends for um, working with big data um, next week there will be something about data formats and uh, this is not ordered here so it's not the, uh, the ordered again agenda here of the course it's some sometimes something from the left side big data and something from the right side advanced SQL for example you see here SQL JSON this is a standard SQL itself is also a standard SQL is a language um, which is standardized there's the SQL standard SQL 92 SQL 99 SQL 2003 so um, a committee of people sit together there are people from Oracle uh, IBM and many others who discuss about the SQL standard it's a very large and big document where they write down how the SQL language should be and how it should work and how it should be used by the users and then there are the vendors the the the, the companies who build the systems the database management systems when we talk about SQL then these are relational database management systems and you know Oracle you know uh, MySQL PostgreSQL IBM DB2 Microsoft SQL Server and they are following the standard more or less <laughs> so they they use different dialects some implement it a bit different than said in the standard and what we do in this lecture here so some parts or many parts don't have anything to do with sql but the things which have something to do with sql then i tell you how the different systems implement that so we will use PostgreSQL here in this lecture because PostgreSQL is very nice and easy to install and the OTH Regensburg has a PostgreSQL server but you also can install it by yourself um, and we will use um, MariaDB because MariaDB has some features which are not available on PostgreSQL yet so features which are standardized written in the SQL standard but not all systems have implemented it or not implemented it yet so and there is one standard SQL JSON you can say a column of my table is of type JSON and then you can store JSON documents there you can then um, create indexes on attributes within these JSON fields you can use query languages and then you think why should I then use a MongoDB database when SQL also supports JSON? And that's what we are talking about in this lecture. So when should you use what? So you will become an expert of topics of databases who not everybody knows. So temporal data management. Select star from products uh, where product ID is 72. Yeah, this gives you information about the product 72. How much does it cost? What's the name of the product? That's a query. But when I say as of system time, the 15th of March 2021, 11 o'clock in the morning, then you see the result of this query as it was yesterday in the morning so that's temporal data management the database management system keeps a history of the data so it locks every single change and insert and delete so you have access to give me the result of this query as of yesterday 
yeah, and not every database system supports this. We will take a look at this feature uh, using, um, I think we will use uh, MariaDB here for that. Spatial data management um, is uh, one of my favorite topics. There you can store uh, geographical data, longitude, latitude, points, and so on. So you have in your database uh, customers, and customers have a name, customers have a, uh, um, a customer number, and customers also have a longitude and latitude. So you can see a customer as a point. So each customer has a point, and then you can say, uh, what are the closest other customers to this customer? Or you have supermarkets here. This supermarket and this supermarket and then find for each customer the closest supermarket. And you can calculate distances, there are functions, data types for geographical data. And that's what we do in the chapter about spatial data management. Recursive SQL is something interesting. Think of a Think of a, of a view or a common table expression. So you say, uh, so you know common table expressions um, with x as, and then you write a select query here. Select blah, 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 blah. And then your main select query says from x. And now recursive SQL means that in this inner subselect here, you use x as itself so it recursively queries itself and with this technique you can write uh, craft queries you can write um, transitive closures uh, compute who your father is your grandfather your grand grand grandfather how many uh, um, descendants or ancestors somebody has you can make tree algorithms with recursive SQL, this will be a chapter uh, recursive SQL. So we will talk about graphs in this lecture as well a lot. Yeah, graphs is written here. Um, there's one standard called resource, resource description frameworks. This is a nice concept of databases which store triples. What is a triple? Three things, subject, predicate, object. So the whole database stores these kinds of triples. Regensburg is in Germany. OTH Regensburg is in Regensburg or something. So you have always these triples. An object or resource, then a predicate is in, for example, uh, and then another object or a value. And the whole database can be queried with a language called Sparkle. And um, yeah, with these triples, the whole data graph is modeled and with Sparkle, you can query that later. Then you can ask questions like, how many people live in the city where the OTH Regensburg is in or something, then you yeah, you don't use joints like in SQL, you, you traverse via these uh, subject predicate object triples. That's the idea behind RDF. We'll also look, about, uh, look at graph uh, languages and we will talk one or two lectures about NoSQL databases. Not more, because I just want to give you the fundamentals of that. I have a lecture called NoSQL databases or NoSQL Datenbanken in Germany um, in the Bachelor of OTH Regensburg. It's a, it's a lecture that you can choose uh, in the end of the bachelor study. It's a German lecture. Um, and there yeah, all kind of NoSQL databases are tried out in detail from Redis, HBase, MongoDB, Neo4j, um, Tinkercraft. So there are different kinds of NoSQL databases are uh, tried out in detail. Here we will just give, a, I just give you an overview about the main properties 
and use cases of NoSQL databases and we will do some exercises on some of uh, the NoSQL databases but only two weeks or so and then you can draw uh, parallels to to SQL and um, yeah compare the concepts with with each other I go back um, here now I'm at the point map reduce this is a paradigm uh, invented by Google to um, make big data analytics so Google said when you have big data uh, distributed across multiple nodes in a cluster about uh, across multiple machines um, it's a challenge to write distributed processing algorithms so to to com to make a computation on the whole data which is distributed across the network this is not so easy so with sql when you don't have a framework for that uh, that's not so easy with MapReduce, you, you write a function map that <laughs> converts all your data items into yeah, key value pairs and reduce uh, then takes all the values for one key and then you have your final result in the end and all this can be computed uh, in the whole cluster in a parallel way. That's the MapReduce algorithm. We will look about that in much more details and we will take a look at the system Hadoop which is a free implementation Apache Hadoop uh, to work with MapReduce um, when you don't work at Google. <laughs> so do you have questions about the agenda about the contents is there something which you also want to learn something that you want to miss uh, not want to miss that you miss so is there something missing or is there something too much that you say I don't want to learn <laughs> something like that or so so do you have questions about the agenda I, I move myself a bit here so When I ask a question, I always have to wait eight seconds because it's not really live. When I say uh, something, you hear it eight seconds later. If you have any questions, any comments, just write it in the chat. I will continue so relational databases is something that you know one ah here's a here's a question or do you provide sample solutions for the exercises in CRIPS um, it depends on the exercise some exercises are just doing something without having a solution or so when you just need to install something I could upload a video how I install it. Um, sometimes I do that, sometimes um, there will be nothing. So it differs from week to week depending on the demand and depending on the topic. So yes and no. Is the lecture like an overview over the uh, NoSQL database lecture? So for people who already attended NoSQL databases, you will learn a lot new here. And people who did not attend NoSQL databases lecture, you will learn everything and you don't have missed anything. So these are two lectures. They overlap, of course, a bit, um, but they, um, they are, the one is not required for the other. So um, this is just, this lecture here has only one chapter called NoSQL databases and uh, yeah it's simply less detailed and faster and quicker not a question but to me it looks quite interesting okay 
a bit more deep dive into NoSQL databases would be uh, great. <coughs> Sorry. Um, offshore. So I will use two weeks or so for NoSQL databases. Maybe more, maybe less. Uh, no, not less. Because I'm a NoSQL person. I like SQL. SQL, I always say, is my native language. Um, but I wrote my PhD thesis about NoSQL databases. I wrote a German book about MongoDB. And uh, yeah, I worked a lot with MongoDB and Neo4j and other NoSQL databases. Uh, so I will talk a lot about NoSQL databases. So you will learn a lot. Which aspects uh, of what concepts are applicable to which use cases? Um, yeah, we will dis discuss when to use what and uh, often this is not so easy to decide. So um, you will learn for yourself the benefits and drawbacks of every concept and we will discuss uh, when to use which system, when to use which concept. We will discuss the alternatives, we will compare them to each other. And when you have a problem or a project by yourself afterwards in your job or so, then you it helps you to know everything. It does not mean that you uh, really need to use temporal data management like we learn it here. I just show you that it exists, how it works and sometimes this is helpful for you in some moment of your uh, professional career. Bing! There's something I remember from modern database concepts and that's what I need here. Sometimes you don't need the concepts anymore. So <laughs> it's important that you learn the concepts. Uh, if you don't know that they exist and, you, and if, you, if you don't know how they work, then you can never use them. But when, when, when you know them, it enables you to uh, work very differently and think differently. Do you have to be an expert in SQL to understand those parts? Um, many things are not related to SQL. Other things are related to SQL. And what means expert? Um, you, you should know SQL, definitely. You should know how to write a query, how to write joins, how to do group by, having, order by. You should know SQL. Uh, it's not necessary that you are an expert in writing uh, 300 lines SQL uh, um, queries with subqueries and so on and complex things. We will concentrate on the uh, on the individual SQL features so that you that that you don't have to uh, be such a big expert. It helps a lot, so I want that you are all experts, but it's also. Uh, uh, sufficient if you just know SQL. So you should know the concept of SQL. And I am sure you will improve your SQL concepts during this lecture here. Yeah. Um, Oracle, MySQL, Microsoft SQL Server, PostgreSQL, IBM DB2, SQLite, MariaDB. These are all products called database management systems and not a database management system for a NoSQL database, but for a relational database. So these are relational database management systems, RDBMSs, relational, relational database management systems. And a relational database consists of tables. Each table has a fixed fixed structure, and that's a very uh, important thing in this lecture here. That you have to define the table before you can insert data into it. So it's clear <laughs> when you work with SQL, you know that you have to say create table, and afterwards you can say insert. But that's a very important thing. We have a fixed structure here. So. You know what normalization means. 
um, that you don't have redundancy here. You uh, participate your, um, your, your, you distribute your tables into multiple tables, which are then connected via joints and so on. Um, you need to say create table to create the metadata of your database before you insert data. You need to use joins in your queries because each table stores only one fact. And to combine facts from multiple tables, you have to join them using primary key and foreign key relationships. In relational databases, you have ACID transactions. ACID stands for atomicity, consistency, isolation and durability. So when you start a transaction, you can uh, bundle multiple actions into one transaction and the one transactions, everything it does is either executed all together, all at once or nothing is executed. So it's not possible to uh, that, that the transaction is only halfly or partially executed. All or nothing, that's atomicity. It's not allowed to, for the database management system to abort in the middle of a transaction. If it does, then everything has to be undone that was already done. Consistency means that each um, transaction remains the database in a consistent state. So when the transaction is finished, then all integrity constraints and so on are fulfilled. Isolation means when multiple transactions are running in parallel, they don't um, disturb each other. They don't interfere with each other. There are no multi-user anomalies and so on. So the transaction management system has to avoid multi-user anomalies to execute all transactions in an isolated way. And durability means when you commit your transaction, then the changes that you made are durably stored within the database. So these are some properties of relational databases. And another one is a relational database is queried with the language SQL. And the current trends are um, kind of uh, moving away from <laughs> Uh, relational databases, but that does not mean that relational databases are uh, being replaced or not used anymore. No, relational databases are the most important ones and they stay the most important ones. Uh, but many companies use them uh, in combination with NoSQL databases and other platforms. So one current trend is big data. Big data uh, consists of yeah, the big data that the companies have and the systems how to store and compute basing on the big data. So big data platforms, data analytic platforms. Companies are using Spark, Hadoop, Flink, Kafka. Yeah, Flink and uh, Kafka, they are data streams, so stream processing is one uh, important trend. Another trend is uh, moving everything to the cloud. The cloud means, uh, yeah, how would you define cloud? Write a, write a definition in, in the chat. How would you define the, the cloud? Exactly. The cloud is other people's computers, other people. So, uh, so somewhere else, it's not at your site. It's not um, on premise. On premise would mean you buy a server. Look, where should I put the server in which room? I need a room. The you room needs climate control, access control. There need to be people who uh, install the system and uh, manage and monitor and administrate the system. And the cloud gives 
a lot of that away to uh, remotely. Someone else's computer, exactly. Remote data, not only storage, but uh, on also computing it there. Yeah, basic level of infrastructure uh, to store data. And um, yeah, in cloud computing, there's always this as a service. So you don't do it by yourself, you book a service. Software as a service means uh, Google Docs. You don't install Microsoft Office on your computer. You use Google Docs as a software, as a service. So it runs in your uh, browser. You don't have to install it because it runs in your browser. You don't have to upgrade it to a new version. It's always the newest version. Um, yeah, the questions are how to, how to pay this software and so on. The next uh, level would be platform as a service. You write applications and you um, um, use the platform to say, okay, my application should uh, store the data in this database. And the database is there. You can simply use it. You don't have to set it up. You don't have to install the database. It's just there within the platform. Okay, the platform limits you. So you can only use the databases that are part of the platform. You can only use the programming languages that are part of the platform. You have to use the uh, concepts and paradigms that they tell to you, but it, it works. It's, it's already set up. Uh, yeah, and with software as a service, you are also limited. When you use Google Docs, uh, you, you can only use the features that are in Google Docs. An infrastructure as a service is basically renting a server. So you have uh, full access to that server. You can log in via SSH to that server, install software. Maybe it's a full Ubuntu system. You can um, install it there. So there you can do almost everything, but you don't have the hardware at your, at your site. So it's hardware remotely in the cloud. So you don't have to care about, oh, I have to replace the hard disk when it breaks and I have to uh, make backups and so on in case of a, a failure. Oh, this is all part of the cloud vendor. Other trends are real-time data processing. So not just batch processing, um, but people want it real-time. There is big data and I don't want um, once per night a report that's also possible but real-time data processing means that you want immediately reactions about something that currently happens data formats are not always structured like in a relational table that we saw on the previous slide we have now unknown data formats or flexible data formats with flexible number of columns and flexible names and data types. Um, strong consistency is a part of the asset paradigm. So when you write a transaction, execute a transaction, commit, then the data is consistent. So the database data is consistent. And in many systems nowadays, YouTube, Facebook, and so on, this is not so important anymore to have the exact number of likes for a video or the number of views. It's okay when the video has 10% more or less views than it's actually. It's more important to have a better performance than um, uh, that everything is 100% accurate and 100% consistent. No SQL databases are a current trend. So you can go to dbengines.com. dbengines.com, there's a page DB ranking. DB, and there you see the um, relational databases, Oracle, they are the most prominent ones. Uh, so this is a ranking based on what's uh, wanted in, in, in job offers. So we want people that can work with Oracle and uh, what the people write about in Stack Overflow and other forums and in blogs and what the news uh, write about these systems. So Oracle is, you know, since the beginning, the most uh, 
uh, most important and top ranked um, database management system. Then there are other relational database management system. And here on uh, rank five, there's the first um, NoSQL database, MongoDB. And then again, the relational database management system. Yeah. This is uh, nice for seeing the current trends. We will take a look in this uh, table uh, later again when we talk about NoSQL databases and so on. Distributed file systems are a trend for storing data um, in a distributed way. So a file system you have on your notebook or your mobile phone or your PC. You simply store files there. And a distributed file system takes a file. Where's the file? Here's a file. It divides it into multiple parts. It stores this part on that machine, this part on that machine and so on. So you can um, then increase your, uh, your computation performance because every machine can participate in analyzing the data. And uh, in a perfect world, this would uh, be 10 times as fast as in a single system when you have 10 machines. Of course, these systems have to talk with each other. We will talk about this later. One other trend are data warehouses. So data warehouse is a um, database management system that's optimized for OLAP queries, online analytical processing. So not online transaction processing like MySQL, uh, PostgreSQL uh, and so on. Uh, data warehouses, they are often in a columnar format and they, um, they are optimized for long running and uh, complex queries. So you move your data or parts of the data from time to time into the data warehouse to make complex analytics there. And many companies use data lakes for complex analytics. So from different sources, from that database system, from an Oracle database, from a MongoDB, they move everything into a big data lake. There everything is together and then different people, data scientists and so on, can access the data that they need to write reports, to um, getting insights, what's happening, to make predictions for the future, uh, to apply machine learning algorithms, to learn, to make recommendations, to, um, yeah, to learn something from the data. Data mining is using the data uh, and don't have a real question to the data, but just giving the data to an algorithm and the algorithm finds patterns, uh, outliers, it finds uh, correspondences, um, can make a uh, can can look into the future and uh, bring things together and uh, yeah combine data without uh, manually writing a query or so so finding facts about the data that you would have never that would never come to your mind by yourself okay the term big data is defined, yeah, what do you think? This is now the first question. Go to frage.de, frage with two A, uh, and you see this poll and simply answer. One person already found it, two. So on many slides, in this lecture, we will make this um, polls here. So here is now, now not a correct answer. So this is not something where you can answer correct or wrong. It's just for yeah, letting you trying out frage.de.
And that's often what the people ask. When is data big data? Is one terabyte big data? Is one gigabyte big data? I say, I don't know. <laughs> Blue is the right answer because it depends. Sometimes one megabyte is already big data. A good definition for big data is too big. <laughs> so what, but, but what means too big? Um, one exabyte data can be very small data. So one gigabyte are one million kilobyte and one um, thousand megabyte, one thousand gigabyte are a terabyte, one thousand terabyte are an exabyte and one thousand exabytes are a petabyte and one thousand petabytes are a setabyte. Byte. Um, but that does not mean that it's then big data. When you have one exabytes um, sensor data with just integer values and you want to calculate the average, that's fast. When you have one gigabyte unstructured text data where you have to write uh, natural language processing algorithms to understand what's the meaning of the text and so on and maybe a human has to look at this text manually then this is big data. So it's, it depends on the data and it depends on, on what to do, what you want to do. There's a, actually a definition of big data and the definition um, uses the three V's or sometimes four V's or five V's. I use the definition with four V's. The most prominent ones are volume, velocity and variety. So you have a large volume, um, you uh, create new data very quickly with a high velocity. The data is not, st not uh, necessarily structured like in relational databases. It has various structures. It has uh, unstructured data, semi-structured data and so on. And the data is often not trustworthy. So it, you have to decide, is this the truth that is in the data? So it, veracity means uh, it is not clear whether you can trust whether this is true, with, whether this is a fact or maybe it's a lie. It contradicts with other data facts. So especially when the users generate data, user generate Twitter feeds and comments and they can write er everything there. And uh, yeah, in a relational database system, you have the truth. You have your products table and when there uh, is dishwasher tabs as a product uh, from, for $3.99, then dishwasher tabs cost $3.99, that's the fact. But when users, when the crowd creates data, it's not 100% clear anymore. Google queries are big data then. Uh, you mean you mean the data that is stored in Google or do you mean the history of queries? So big, big data is the data. It has these uh, properties here. So a query is querying the data, but the query is not the big data. I will give you some details here. This uh, is a chart which I found on Wikipedia uh, with the three Vs here. Volume, megabytes, gigabytes, petabytes. So the larger the volume, the more it is big data. Yes. <laughs> um, so the more it fulfills the um, definition of big data. <laughs> There's a, a nice comment from uh, one expert, um, <laughs> value, value is the fifth V. I don't use the, this definition with five Vs. So what's the value that you can extract from the data? So, and there are six and seven Vs. So the people write 
papers and blog articles to uh, make more and more Vs for the definition for big data. You could query the queries, of course. That's what's done. Uh, Google Trends queries queries to make a chart and a report of what people are searching for currently. Yeah, that's of course big data analytics. Okay, um, velocity. There are two kinds of velocity. Velocity in data production. So a sensor system produces data every millisecond. Uh, Twitter produces data every millisecond because people are writing tweets and clicking and uh, liking and so on. And uh, there's also um, velocity on the on the other side, on the consumer side. So you, the data is there. Do you want to make the real-time analytics? That's more velocity, more the definition of big data than batch processing. So these are the dimensions that of uh, of data velocity. Um, so do you want only a one-time job? I have data here. I want to calculate something and this is a PDF and then I print it out and then I bring it to my boss and then I say this is the report that you wanted or do you want periodic uh, processing that you want to compute this report every day or every hour or a near real-time uh, report that something uh, that a light gets so like when 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 somebody is uh, when something is going wrong that then this light is turning red and now everything is fine again then it's green and now it's blue so <laughs> on real time it, it reacts and there's a thing in between between real time and periodic and this is called near real time and for many applications this is sufficient people don't want real time so real time is required so that a self-driving car don't crashes into a uh, into a wall or something and near real time is yeah algorithms where it's okay to have the response to the, the reaction one minute later or so yeah and ver ver variety is this red dimension here um yeah the the the, the, the small variety is in relational databases, tables and so on. Uh, then you have databases like NoSQL. And then you have data which are very various. So photos, webs and audio, you have to first uh, interpret the contents of that data, of that files. And then you have uh, social media um, where you also have the, um, the problem in what data is true, what is fake, and so on. This picture shows uh, all four Vs now, volume, variety, velocity, and veracity. When we take a look at veracity here, you see that uh, business leaders don't trust in the information they use to make decisions. So big data is used for making decisions and when you cannot trust your data, then your decisions are based on, yeah, <laughs> on something that you don't trust. It can be a problem. Poor data quality. So people have to implement metrics for um, rating how trustful is your data and how to filter out uh, bad quality data or make data cleaning and uh, and uh, remove bad items and so on. Volume just focuses here on the large sizes. So 40 setabytes, these are 43 trillion gigabytes of data will be created last year. Uh, blah, blah, blah. These are just big numbers. Velocity means 
that uh, it, it, the data is generated very quickly. So here 18.9 uh, 18 billion network connections. Um, in uh, in in a year i think this is on these sensor systems you see when a car has 100 sensors for tire pressure fuel level and other things individual sensors these sensors produce data every millisecond or even more often and the most important thing is then to uh, throw away what what's not necessary and pre-aggregate and then you store it somewhere to make reports or make real-time data processing there and on variety we have some examples 400 million tweets sent by the users and tweets are unstructured data Videos are also unstructured data, but they have a title and and maybe categories and so on. Yeah. And one last info traffic that I want to show you is what happens in an internet minute. So this is uh, velocity. So the data uh, is produced at a high velocity. So in each minute, uh, 20 million photos are viewed on a Flickr page or uh, 320 new Twitter accounts register every minute. 3000 photos are uploaded to Flickr and 100,000 new tweets are sent per minute and so on. So you see this. Uh, high uh, rate of data production. So velocity on the one hand means data is produced very fast, new data is produced very fast. And uh, the other point of velocity is that you want to quickly respond to the changes in the data to react on that real-time data processing. This was the definitions of V. The connection are at any given point in time. Ah, okay, yeah, that this uh, slide with the internet connections are so currently 18.9 billion um, devices are connected with each other, and these are 2.5 per person. So I'm connected with my PC, with my smartphone and my router and <laughs> yeah. Okay, a little summary about the four Vs. Volume means the data is too large to handle with traditional approaches. That's the definition of the big data uh, property volume. It's too large to handle with traditional approaches and traditional approaches are relational databases for example or Excel files or um, other files. A solution for uh, coping with the volume is scaling up. Uh, this means you buy a faster CPU or you increase the number of memory, the amount of memory in your system, or scaling out. We come to this on the next slide. Um, so buying more machines and working with multiple machines in parallel, multiple computers. Then you have to store your data on a distributed file system in a distributed way. And then you can process it using distributed processing approaches. Velocity means on the one hand, many inserts per time unit. And on the other hand, the demand on real-time processing or near real-time processing. And a solution for that are streaming platforms. Stream, <laughs> not uh, Twitch and YouTube, 
no, uh, data stream processing frameworks like Kafka, Spark, Streaming, Flink, uh, yeah. And NoSQL databases, some of them are also optimized for a high velocity because relational databases are optimized for the data is there and you often write select queries much more often than insert and update. So the data can increase and they can update and there are deletions, but the most often query is a select query. That's how relational databases are optimized for. Definition of variety is, uh, okay, there's a very flexible definition, data without a fixed schema. So various data formats, media data, multimedia data, structured data, unstructured data, semi-structured data, and so on. And semi-structured data are XML and JSON. We'll talk about this next week. And NoSQL databases are made for um, data which does not follow a fixed schema, but the, the schema is flexible. And veracity means it's not clear whether the data con contains true or false information. So you have to use algorithms for detecting uh, true and false informations, um, machine learning algorithms, natural language processing, um, which try to extract information from the data that's generated by users. Okay, this, this was a lot, a lot blah blah. So it's uh, important to know the, the concepts of big data and why it's important and what are the current trends. Now we are getting technically uh, again. So we will at the rest of this lecture in the last 20-25 uh, minutes now look in some internal details how to manage big data, how big data platforms work. This is not how they work. Scaling up, as I said, means adding CPUs to your server, adding memory to your server. So you currently have 100 gigabytes of memory and you increase it to 200 gigabytes of memory. So you go to an online shop, Dell, and say, I need 200 uh, gigabytes of additional memory. Then they bring you the memory This is a USB stick, but okay. Uh, you put it into your server and then you start your algorithm and you hope that your algorithm is faster than before. This works, but it's very limited. So the benefit is you, you, you simply buy it, put it in, works. So you don't have to change your software. You don't have to implement other algorithms than before. Um, when some algorithm uh, uses a lot of uh, input output operations on the hard disk and you have a hard disk, a hard drive, which is a rotating disk, you can replace that by a solid state drive and then it's faster. Maybe you all recognize this that when your laptop uses a solid state drive, then your operating system boots faster, everything starts faster, so it's worth it to replace your hard drives to SSDs. For servers, this is not always true, so, so it's, it does not make it slower, but for many algorithms, they focus on uh, CPU and memory. Um, then, then it doesn't give you a big benefit when you replace your hard drives uh, to SSD drives. So it depends on what you do. When you want to mine Bitcoin, you need a good uh, CPU or a good uh, GPU, a, a good graphic card, uh, and then you cannot mine more Bitcoin when you 
add more memory to your system. So it depends on the algorithms, the, 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 what you want to do. But this means scaling up. You simply put more hardware into your machine. It's easy and no changes in software are required, but it's expensive because um, it is necessary in this approach to buy the best CPU and the best CPU is much, much more expensive than twice the second best CPU. So uh, when you come to the limits of what is possible, the best CPU, the uh, fastest memory and so on, uh, the prices are extremely high. What about adding a, a GPU? Yes, you are right. That's also uh, scaling up. Um, as I said, depending on the algorithm, um, I'm a database person and uh, currently in databases, GPUs are not so important yet. So um, it is starting right now that GPUs are used for machine learning within databases, but you are absolutely right when you use MapReduce or Spark or machine learning algorithms, they, you can improve them by adding GPUs to your cluster. So I should add this here, of course, yeah. But what does GPU have for an icon? <laughs> okay, yeah, and the most important drawback here is it's simply limited. So you, you end somewhere. You cannot add more GPUs, not more CPUs, and there's no space left, no slot anymore for more memory. So this approach of scaling up is expensive and limited. So this is scaling up. Look at this complex animation. Bam. <laughs> this is scaling up. Um, scaling up is also called scaling vertically. You have a machine and this scales vertically means this machine gets more performant. Scaling out means you scale horizontally. Look at this server here. Scaling out means you add a second one and then a third one. And this now is not limited anymore. Google has million servers and when this is too slow, they buy another million servers. So it's not limited anymore. Um, and two techniques that I will show you now um, very quickly, which are used uh, when you use a distributed system. So you, you have now not a single system anymore, not a single machine, but a cluster consisting of multiple nodes. We call each machine in a cluster a node. And scaling horizontally means adding more nodes. Oh, it is too slow. And yeah, I cannot add any CPUs or memory anymore to my machines. I simply buy a new machine. And this approach is very popular because this way companies don't need special hardware anymore. A DB2 mainframe from IBM was a very, or is, you can still buy it, is a very expensive machine uh, or supercomputers are very expensive. Um, they are fast, yes, but they are expensive and it's cheaper to simply buy commodity hardware, buy the machines that you can buy at the shop in MediaMarkt or Dell.com or yeah, at the normal at the normal supermarket where people buy servers. Uh, so you buy normal hardware and this is not so expensive, but they are not so fast, but then you simply buy multiples of them. And then you can also scale in again. Scale in means Christmas is over. There's no demand for a third node. My system is fast enough when I have two nodes. 
so you can also reduce the number of nodes again so you save uh, energy uh, when this is not a system in your computing center but in the cloud then you simply don't have to pay for that additional node anymore so you are more flexible then and then uh, you, you you have an advertisement on tv and then the people come to your web shop and then you buy another machine and then one week later you you scale back again so you are very flexible then it's also called elasticity it's elastic that's why amazon calls it the amazon elastic compute cloud ec2 amazon elastic compute cloud so you can elastically uh, add and remove more nodes oops you can rent that spare node for more profits. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's the Amazon Marketplace. You, you, you have a, a server for one year and you don't need it anymore, then you can rent it uh, uh, or sell it on Amazon Marketplace or you can rent from somebody else. And uh, yeah, this is uh, because the cloud is so, so public. Doesn't scaling out usually mean just adding new instances, containers of microservices, not so much booting up additional machines? Um, it means both. So scaling out means adding a machine to the cluster. This cluster can be a cluster of physical machines. So you have real physical machines um, and you buy a new one. So scaling out works in a traditional computing center. You order a new uh, server, put it in a rack, turn it on. This is scaling out. Scaling out in the cloud means adding another VM, another, uh, what do you say, another container of microservices. So it's just adding more components, individual components. They, 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 are, they are individual machines here. This is scaling out. Yeah, and when you don't have everything on one machine anymore, you can ask the question, what data do you store here? What data do you store here? What data do you store here? And one technique is called replication. This means we store the same data on multiple nodes. So I insert a new product, uh, dishwasher tabs. I insert it here and here and here. So every machine has the same data. That's replication. Storing copies. Every node is a copy of the other node. Then you think, okay, this is a waste of storage, um, but it, 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 it helps us. So we will talk about replication very soon. What do you think? What's the benefit of replication? Go to Frage with 2A, VE, and uh, answer what is replication. Here's one person who, who answered very quickly and uh, frage.de allows that you stay on that website and it pops up when there's a new question. <laughs> so you can vote When there are 60 responses, I will show you the answer. I don't vote, I, I know the answer. I, and I'm sure you also know the answer. Uh, it's a bit, this, this question is stupid. Both is correct. Yeah, most of you are right. High availability, availability means 
I ask a question, I get an answer. That's the definition of availability. I ask a question, I get an answer. A system is available, is available when it gives you an answer to your question. And availability is very flexible. You can say uh, an, an, uh, one system is more available than another system because this system gives you the answer faster than the other system. So high availability means um, even if the system or a part of the system crashes, available availability is still given. So even if one server fails, I get an answer to my question because the data is already on the second and the third node. It's also there. So these also can give me the answers. So high availability is a big benefit of replication. So the, the system stays available even when a part of it crashes. I go to a website, an online shop, and one minute later, a server crash happens and I, as a user, don't see that. So I don't know that this happened because there are many servers and they have redundant data copies stored by using replication techniques. And load balancing means um, yeah, 3 million people want to access the online shop, 1 million are rooted here. So this server answers the queries from the 1 million users, this from the other million and this from the other million users. So you can balance your load better so that they have less work to do, less queries to answer because you use a load balancer and you route them there and there and there. Partitioning and sharding is something else. I showed you already an example of sharding. This is the data and I create three shards. And I store this shard on the first machine, this shard on the second machine and this shard on the third machine. So distributed storage of data across the cluster nodes and partitioning this it's called partitioning but others call it sharding so partitioning and sharding is basically it's it's the same thing partitioning is also used for 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 something else but for what we talk about here we call it partitioning to partition the data across the cluster nodes so parts of the data are stored here, other parts here and other parts here. And there you don't have high availability because when this machine crashes, then the part that is stored here is gone. It is away. So <laughs> when, when one machine fails, the system is not available anymore. That's why replication and partitioning is used always in combination. Thus, same data equal to evenly distributed data. Um, evenly distributed means the same amount on each machine, right? Uh, but when it's when so same data, you mean uh, replication on replication of course it's evenly distributed because every machine has the same data then it's uh, evenly distributed or equally distributed the same machine stores <laughs> the, 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 each machine stores the same amount of data so more examples here about replication and sharding and then we are finished for today. Replication, I write query, update product, set price 350 for the product 29. Product 29, these are dishwasher tabs. They cost $3.99. So, and I want to increase the price now and I have a um, distributed system consisting of three nodes and the data is replicated 
with replication factor 3. So factor means uh, times. So everything is three times stored. So when I want to store one terabyte data, I need three terabytes hard disks because every node needs the one terabyte hard drive. Um, so replication factor three. I, the, the first question is to which node do I send this query? There are multiple approaches. Some have a master node on top that does not store data. Uh, some systems have a master node, which is one of the data nodes. So you have to talk to that. Then there are systems which have multi master. So you can send this query to any of the nodes and then it uh, updates the price. For example, you send the query here and then it talks to the other machines. Hey, the price of product 29 is uh, now 450. It's updated. And it, you see it takes some time. First, this is here. Now the database is not in a consistent state. It is in a, yeah, it is eventually consistent. So eventually, at some point in the future, it will be consistent again. But temporary, the system is inconsistent. So when you now would ask, hey, node number three, what's the price of the dishwasher tabs? Then you have, uh, stale data. This data is not um, valid anymore. But for many use cases, this is not so important to have always uh, consistency. So now everything is fine again. The benefit, as I already said, and you answered in the poll, um, you have high availability, the system is still available even if one or even if two nodes fail in this case. So for replication factor three, it means even if n minus two, so uh, if n minus two, n minus one, even if two um, machines fail, the data is available, the system can answer your queries. Load balancing, let's say I want to um, compute the sum of all prices of all products, then this machine can do this for the for a third of the products, this machine for the other third, and this for uh, the third third, <laughs> and then they can combine their result again. So they can uh, support each other. Uh, uh, that's what I said with distributed computing. So they can support each other in making distributed computations. And load balancing was what I said to improve the, uh, the load. So uh, there are many requests sent to the database and you simply send a third of the requests to this node, a third here and a third here. So they have less work to do because the others are also working. Um, Shouldn't we say the same amount of data instead of same data? I think you are already at uh, the point partitioning or sharding. Replication simply means really the same data. You, 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 you store a full copy of this machine's data on this machine and on this machine. So for pure replication, it's really the same data on all nodes. I think he means if every node stores the same data or data is spread evenly. In this case, replication, really the same data. And with a evenly distributed, that's uh, what I will tell you in a minute when I talk about sharding. Um, two other slides about replication. Um, there is master-slave replication, so there is a master, so you have to talk to this master to write this update query here. So you send the update query to the master, the master then uh, sends either the query again or the information about the data blocks that changed to the other um, system. So statement replication would be uh, this statement 
is sent to the master and then the master sends it here and here so they can then apply the statement on their data again or binary replication would be uh, the master says to the slave hey on file db562 dot dot uh, on byte 745 to 747 there is now 00111001 so just an information what on the disk should be changed to uh, replay this replication here and there's synchronous and asynchronous replication synchronous replication means the replication process so replicating the data across the cluster is part of the transaction itself so i say update products the product new price is 450 and then i say commit the question is when do i get the acknowledgement of, uh, of this commit Um, so um, this question has to appear a bit later because you should understand what what synchronous means synchronous means the commits gets acknowledged when the replication is finished so you say commit then the replication starts and when all nodes have um, uh, stored the new value for 50 then your commit is finished and asynchronous replication means the replication is not part of the transaction so your commit is uh, acknowledged and then so it's acknowledged when it's written on one node and then afterwards um, it is transferred to the other nodes so commit is acknowledged when the changes are written to one node and then this node sends the changes to the other nodes so now my question is what happens when a node is down so this node here is down and you use asynchronous replication asynchronous replication means you commit how long does the lecture take yeah i i will uh, do the rest very quickly now so we are finished in two minutes sorry for for being late or over time okay i i give you the solution here everything is fine because the update is sent the transaction is committed the data is written here and then the client sees everything is fine that the data is not yet replicated to that node because this node here is down is not the problem of the user so when it wakes up again then the replication has to be finished here but the system stays available the transaction will not be aborted and it will not take a long time because the replication is not part of the transaction itself okay that's what I already said. Strong consistency means um, clients always read data that is up to date. That always read the current data. And eventual consistency, that's the opposite. I update the price and it's not yet written to node 3. And when somebody uh, asks a query to the node 3, uh, it may happen that they see not the current price, but the old value. So that's eventual consistency. In the future, in some seconds or milliseconds or minutes, uh, the system is consistent again. Then you see the current price. But for a short amount of time, it can happen that you see old dated values. And now a quick example of partitioning. Um, oh, I think I will... I, 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 yeah, I, I do it very quickly so that we can finish this chapter here today. Uh, partitioning means you say, uh, write parts of the data to this machine, parts here and parts here. And range partitioning means um, you partition by a range of values. For example, the product IDs from 
uh, up to 999 are stored on this machine. The products with product IDs between 1000 and 1999 are stored here. So you define a range or the system automatically de determines this range and uh, it distributes it here. And when you then say, give me uh, the price of the product 450, then your query is sent to this machine. Give me uh, the price of the product 3000, then you ask that machine. And it does not only say, it does not only support equality checks, but also smaller, smaller equal, greater equal, and so on. A drawback on range partitioning is that hotspots can occur. When the current data is on this machine and you only access the current data, then these machines here have nothing to do. And now I understand what you said in the chat with the equally distribution. The, the, the target should be, the goal should be that every machine stores about the same amount of data. So. Uh, it would not be a good uh, range partitioning if 90% of the data would be here, five here, five here. So it should be, the, the, the ranges should be adjusted so that you have an equal distribution. And now last slide and last question. Uh, hash partitioning is an approach where we simply compute using a hash function. So something blah, blah, blah. and uh, we assign each node a number and then we want to store the key k and the question is where to store this uh, item we use a hash function to compute a value and the node which has the closest value to the value that we compute there it will be stored store the data with the key on the node whose hash is closest to the hash value of our current key. So now I say thank you. And if you have any questions, ask them now in the chat. You can do this little computation now in the, in the last minute of this lecture here. You can do this uh, tomorrow when you want. Uh, you can click pause or what else. We are finished now. Um, this is just a question whether you uh, understood it correct. You need a, a calculator which can work with big numbers. So on, on, on which of those three nodes is the value, the product 29 stored? You have to calculate uh, oh, there's a it's an error. Um, hey. this, this, this question makes no sense. Sorry for that. There's no, uh, there's, there's no K. Uh, what, what did I do there? Sorry. <laughs> I, uh, I will I will put su such an exercise on on an uh, on an exercise sheet. Sorry for that. Here's a K missing. I don't remember it now. Okay, so this is not. Uh, I just want to just give you a quick uh, introduction of the of the challenges in big data management and uh, just giving you an overview what replication and uh, sharding or partitioning means um, a little summary here. We looked at the big data definition, the four Vs, volume, velocity, variety, veracity, what scale up and scale out means. For replication, we looked at master slave, asynchronous and synchronous replication. And we looked at the difference between strong consistency and eventual consistency. And for sharding, two approaches, sharding by a range of values or using a hash function to compute where should a data item be stored. So now sorry for uh, being 10 minutes late. I hope that I will compensate this in another lecture, I'm very sure. And uh, yeah, see you next week. Goodbye.